All right, guys, Adam Trigger here with Wager Talk. The college basketball preview tour rolls on. We're going to get to 30 of these by tip-off on November 4th. And today we're talking Syracuse basketball. I obviously had to bring a Cuse preview in. I do one every year. They're kind of my hometown team at this point, um, at least the, one of the closest proximity teams to where I live. And I'm bringing back my good friend, Jeff Buff, Jeff Buffum, Syracuse super fan and season ticket holder. Um, he killed it in the Syracuse preview last year. Um, if you watch that preview, you probably cashed five or six overs before the market adjusted to uh, Syracuse and, and the tempo that they played last year. So, Jay Buff, welcome in. And um, how, are you excited for hoop season? It's right around the corner. Yeah. Hey, Adam, thanks for having me on again. Uh, great to uh, have college basketball getting ready to start up here in about three weeks and um, looking forward to another good season. I think Syracuse is going to, you know, maybe be pretty good this year with some of the, the moves and the incoming freshmen that we have. So, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Uh, hopefully got some good home games at the Dome again this year. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It'll be fun. So, Jeff, I don't always spend the majority of the preview on the roster. Like, I, you know, every team's a little bit different, but I think we got to do due diligence to this roster because I give Coach Autry an A-plus for the roster. Like, when you look at this team, uh, knowing we were going to the offseason, knowing Syracuse was going to go into the offseason, lose Judah Mintz, and then obviously, uh, you know, Kadir Copeland, Malik Brown both move on as well. Um, I did not think that on paper the roster was going to look this good coming into the season. So, you know, I, I actually think some people might be a little bit of a, a sleep on Syracuse just based on where I'm seeing them in previews, right? Like they're, they're sort of being billed as like a middle of the pack team. And, and that's very possible, but the roster has a, a very high upside in my opinion, uh, which we'll go through in a second. Uh, it's, it's year number two for coach Autry at times, Last year, I, I thought he was a little bit, got a little bit outclassed in the coaching department. There was a stretch of games where I, I think we maybe lost games on coaching. Um, if you go to like mid January to mid February, but toward the end of the season, everything kind of came together a little bit from an organizational standpoint. So uh, I guess when you look at this roster, what's the first thing that jumps out at you? And do you think Autry can kind of take a step forward in the coaching department to get this team on the same page earlier, sooner rather than later? Yeah, I definitely do. <clears throat> I was in a group text with a whole bunch of friends last year that, you know, I've been friends with since high school that are big Syracuse fans too. And, you know, I was a little bit critical at points, but when you think about it, I mean, the ACC is a really tough conference and we, we had 20 wins last year. So for Autry to get 20 wins in his first season when he's really not playing with his recruits and, you know, maybe a little bit of different type of style of basketball that he really wants to play, but he had to adjust because of the players that were on the team. I, I think he did really good for his first year. And I think that, um, like you mentioned, some of the tougher teams, I think he was out coached and outclassed a little bit, but I think the, the, the improvement that he made throughout the year. And I think that the potential for him to, you know, turn this program around and get back to where we're, we get into March Madness every year is it, high. Um, you mentioned the roster. Yeah. I mean, he did a great job this year with the transfer portal. We haven't had a really good quality center in the paint in the last, you know, four or five, six years, probably since Raheem Christmas left the Qs and he went and he got Lampkin from Colorado, a big guy that can score the basketball, but also, rebound and, and play defense and, you know, help out Syracuse getting some po um, pay, uh, points in the paint. We haven't really been able to do that over the last few years. We've been a more of a perimeter team, um, you know, running and gunning, shooting three pointers and things mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, I thought <clears throat> getting uh, Lampkin from Colorado was big. I think having a backup point guard is going to really help the kid that we're getting from Hofstra. Uh, I can't remember what his name is. Oh, Carlos. Yeah, so that's, wa yeah Joaquin yeah, that's, Carlos. That's Carlos. He's a, yeah. So I was going to say, gonna, well, that's where I, that's where I was that's where I was going to start. Is I think he's going to end up being the starting guard, I, and we'll see how the, the how the offense shakes out. But I guess the 
you know, you, you touched on Lampkin. He's kind of like the household name here at this point. He's been to three major programs. He's a grad transfer. We've seen him play for TCU in Colorado now. I feel like you, you know that you're at worst, you're going to get like probably a guy that sits on the fringe of a double double every night, takes up a lot of space in the paint, can, can, can play his position. Like there's, I think that's probably the least of, of the question marks on the roster, even though he's new to the program, because I mean, he's been doing it in college basketball for years. He's just, I think, you know, what you're going to get there. And, and that's some, like you said, some consistency on the interior, which we didn't, you know, the Syracuse did not necessarily have uh, last season or the last couple seasons, but let's talk about the backcourt. And you mentioned Jaquan Carlos who comes over from Hofstra. Now he's got big shoes to fill buff, because that, that was obviously Judah Mintz's position, and that's a talented guy to lose. But Carlos might actually be a, a better point guard in the in the respect. He's more of a facilitator. He's more of a passer. You know, at times last year it was I, – I don't know if we didn't know – or Syracuse didn't know who was going to take the shot, whether it was Mintz, whether it was J.J. Starling. But, but I think this year – and this is going to go back to Autry getting – his team on the same page and and this goes back to coaching and it's something I'll be looking for in the early games this season. You know, Carlos looks like the facilitator. It, it, he can hit a shot. It's not like he can't shoot. He, he was a double digit uh, scorer for Hofstra last year, but he's more of a true point guard. And now you pair him with JJ Starling. Who's, who's the star in my opinion, he's the guy that can score and bell who's who kind of turned into your shooter you know, he he probably works better when others are doing the work for him. That looks like a really dangerous backcourt with a huge upside. Yeah, I agree 100%. I wasn't really sure, like, you know, like you mentioned with the starting, uh, how that's going to go with, we got Chance Westry too, who, you know, is kind of a, a maybe a, a big two or possibly a three, but uh, he played a little bit of guard when he was at Auburn before he came over to mm -hmm. Syracuse. Didn't get a chance to play last year because he had some injuries, but he redshirted. So we got him this year, too. But for sure, I think that um, Starling is going to be able to have a lot of opportunities this year. Um, shooting guard, have a really good dedicated point guard that, like you mentioned, is more focused on getting the offense to flow, making good passes. I think Judah Mintz was more of a scorer than he was really a point guard. I mean, yeah, he did a good job of running the point, but a lot of times he wanted to take matters into his own hands. He sometimes took some really mm -hmm. tough shots. I thought in the half court, sometimes we got a little bit uh, kind of starstruck by people standing around and watching Judah do what Judah does. I, I think the offense is going to – is the motion and the movement of the offense is going to be better with Joaquin. I think that – Starling will be able to, you know, feel comfortable at the two position, um, not feel like, you know, when the shot clock's going down that he's not comfortable taking the shot. I, I definitely think that this is a, a year that Starling might be able to flourish and we might see that his numbers and his stats are going to, you know, kind of rise this year in the position that he's going to be in with such a solid mm -hmm. quote unquote point guard. <clears throat> Yeah, no, I think I think you nailed that. I think J.J. Starling has the – this could be his coming out party year, right? Like he took a little bit of a step back in, in the shooting department early last season, but also you got to give him – got to give him a break in the respect that like didn't really work out at Notre Dame, that wasn't a great team. Then he has to come back to, to Syracuse and kind of share the backcourt with Mintz. Like to, to Judah Mintz's defense, he kind of had to do that at times, right? Like, like I, I think – he, he was in the position where he had to be that guy and, and kind of go out and create because last year's Syracuse roster didn't really have a ton of that until Starling sort of started to get comfortable and, and take over, you know, as like a, a, someone that can get to the hoop, play in the mid range. And, and once those two got on the same page, Buff, they really started to work extremely well together. But you already talked about Lampkin and it looks like we're going to have it, that Syracuse is going to have more of a, of a threat on the inside than they did last season. Uh, but talk to me about Donnie Freeman, because I uh, full disclosure, I do not follow the high school, high school kids, like a lot of other college basketball, you know, handicappers do I'm, I'm doing baseball all summer. So when I see new names, I, I have to kind of, you know, learn them as the season goes on. Uh, but buff talk to me about Donnie Freeman 
I, we know he's a five-star recruit, but what else do you know about him? And, and do you see him making an instant impact on the Syracuse team? Yeah. And before we do go into talking about Donnie, we got to remember that we also have this kid named Lucas Taylor that transferred from Georgia yep. State. That's a really good shooting guard. He averaged almost 18 points a game uh, last year. He shot almost 40% from three-point range. I think he's going to get some mm -hmm. playing time coming playing time coming off the bench at shooting guard too. So we do have, yeah, and he started, I think he started at wake forest. So he has some, some ACC exposure. Yep. Yep. He did. So we're going to have some depth at the guard position. Now, when you talk about Donnie Freeman, I did see him play a few times in AAU. Uh, he's the real deal. This guy is really good. He's got height. He can play in the paint. He's got a good mid range game. Uh, Good ball handler can bring the ball up the court if we needed him to do that. Um, a little bit underrated, if you ask me, as far as an outside shooter. A lot of his, uh, you know, accolades were about more of how he gets to the basket, his po his, uh, you know, post game, you know, getting in the paint, things like that. He can shoot the ball, and he's a really good perimeter shooter that's going to be able to stretch the defense a little bit which will help open up the paint for Lampkins. So, yeah, Donnie Freeman is is the real deal. We haven't had a five-star recruit in, in quite some time. And uh, from what I've seen through AAU, he's really good. I mean, I, I he was on ESPN a couple times. I went and saw him when we were in Virginia um, two years ago when he was playing AAU at some tournament, um, the Benny Williams tournament down in Norfolk, Virginia. He's a really good player. I think that we're going to – uh, you know, we're, we're, he's, I, I wouldn't be surprised Adam if, if he starts immediately. Oh, I was going to say like, it, it, it appears that he's on track to start. I, I would be surprised if he's not paired with Lampkin, like right off the bat as, as the sort of two in the, you know, the two forwards Lampkin's more of a center. So you got a forward center and then, you know, I think it's going to be Starling um, bell Chris for bell. sure. And, and then the point, yeah, and then the point guard from Hofstra. But, yeah, it was a great point you made about uh, about Taylor. Um, and it really speaks to, I think, what we're trying to build to here as we do. Uh, you know, this is a betting preview, and we're going to get to some, like, ways to bet this team. But the, I think what we're doing here is just showcasing the depth of actual talent on this roster. You know, a, a guy that – where I can add some value is from the mid-majors because, you know, if I follow mid -major, you know, some of these mid-major teams closely. And, and a guy I've been oh, yeah. following closely for years is Jair Davis from Delaware. And, and yep. the fact that we haven't even brought him up yet, just again, it goes to show you how deep this roster is with, with skilled players. I mean, this is a guy that was the post presence, the post threat for Delaware the last couple of years. And, you know, that was a Delaware team where they were basically surrounding him with four guards. I mean, he's only six seven. He's not like a true center, but it, in the context of that Delaware team, oftentimes they played with four guards, and and you know he kind of let him do his thing in the middle. But he he has a really interesting game because he's not like a he's a post player, but you know he's got a great game from like eight to ten feet from the basket. Like he hits that shot consistently. He'll get you some rebounds, but again, like he's not going to be asked to be you know, to, to be the main rebounding threat on this team. Although certainly when he's in the game, he averaged seven seven point five rebounds per game for Delaware last year. So you never really know how these guys are going to translate going from mid-major to power conference. In Davis's case, mid-major kind of main big to, you know, now likely playing alongside Lampkin, or I suppose Syracuse could go smaller, have him and Freeman in, uh, you know, at the same time. So, uh, again, just like so many options for this Syracuse team. Buff, talk to me about this. When Lampkin is not on the floor, does this team go smaller? Like, is there is there two sort of styles of play, maybe one for Lampkin, one without? Because when you take him out, I'm not seeing like another – I don't think they're going to play McLeod much. So uh, could they go – like, is that like an advantage? Like, you were super you, – you were all over the pace of play for this team last year. So talk to me about what you're seeing in that respect this season. A little birdie told me that we might see a little bit more of Patterson this year too. We don't forget about him. Okay. Six, six foot ten guy. Uh, Patterson um, didn't get in the um, didn't get really get in the game very often last year. From what I'm hearing is he, he he improved a lot over the summer. He's been doing pretty good so far in the in the little practices and preseason stuff that they've been doing up there so far. 
Uh, I agree with you. I don't think we're going to see a lot of McLeod only because when teams run the high screen and the pick and roll, he's just so slow. He can't either get back in the paint or he can't mm-hmm. get out on the shooter. He can't get out on the shooter fast enough. So um, I think we might see Patterson a little bit. But yes, I agree with you 100 percent. The game and the style is going to change a little bit. If Lampkins is out of the game, I could see them possibly maybe playing a little bit more zone uh, when Lampkins is on the bench. And, you know, I don't know. I mean, I I still think what we saw last year is Autry wants to play fast. I I don't think that's going to change this year. I think he wants to get up and down the floor. I think that he wants to play in transition. He wants to make the game faster. He knows that Syracuse, over the years, we've struggled in the half-court offense. Maybe this year, we might be a little bit better with a solid point guard and a a few more options in the paint to be able to dump it down low and have a little bit of confidence that our post players will be able to get some points for us. But, yes, I agree. I think that the style or how we play, if if Lampkins gets in foul trouble, might be a little bit different. Yeah. Now, listen, we've we've talked for, you know, 10, 15 minutes about all the things we like about this team. And I do think that there is a ton to like, you know, people are going to say Trig and Buff, they're homers. They 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 they're Syracuse fans. So they're just going to come on and talk about, you know, the good part. But there, there is some, you know, there, there's some things I'm looking for as as potential negatives for this team. At least, the, you know, this is what I'll be watching for early in the season when I'm trying to figure out how to bet this team. Buff, the one thing is defense. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about Syracuse defensively for a couple of reasons. One, during that stretch I mentioned where I felt like Autry was getting out coached a little bit, it, it, it was defensive organization was the issue, right? Like the, the game that comes to mind was the Wake Forest game when I think we gave up 100 points. A- and it was just, you know, there was another one against Boston College where uh, they had their one big that we could just could not figure out how to defend. And so defensive organization, I think, is is – a cause for concern when you consider the fact that your best three, three defensive players last year were Mintz, Kadir Copeland, and Malik Brown. So that that to me is concerning. Are, are you you have the same vibes there, or do you have higher hopes for Syracuse as a defensive team this year? No, not at all. And we saw that over the whole course of the year last year is that Autry as a coach and the team they just were not a very good defense of unit. And I think. As we've talked about so many positives with the additions that are coming in with the transfers and also the freshmen, I think with all the new pieces, it's going to be harder to get the defense to start off in such a good, you know, positive vibes, good mo, you know, good mojo. I I, I can see that being a problem again this year. I think maybe we might be able to guard the pick and roll and the high screens a little bit better because we got some athletes now. We got some guys that can move. Yep. So I think I think in that aspect, we might be able to to guard that type of stuff a little better, which last year we just know us guys wide open outside the three point line that like you said, that Wake Forest game. I think they had like, you know, fifty something points in the first half and they made like eleven yep. threes or ten threes. It's just yeah, it was really, really hard to watch. Another thing is we haven't talked about really highly recruited four-star named Elijah Moore. This kid is supposed to be really good, good defender. So, you know, I don't know really how Autry's going to use him. I, I'm, I'm not really sure where he's going to fit in this year as a freshman, but um, I want to tell you that I'm really kind of leaning towards the beginning of the season is taking overs in Syracuse's games again, because like you said, I think that as a brand new unit with all the new additions, I think that possibly the defense is going to be a little bit rough and teams are going to be able to score points. And if we have the same style where we like to get out and run and we want to play run and gun type basketball, these games in the beginning could be a good idea to start targeting the total and maybe we adjust as we go. Yep. So, Buck, we'll go back to last year's preview as we get into we are at the point where we're going to wrap this up and give kind of a betting outlook. Um, before Adrian Autry ever coached a game, you were all over his pace being much faster. Like I said, if you go back and watch our preview from last year, Buff was all over that 
Syracuse being like just a, a an over team. The, I think the over cashed like at a crazy rate through like the first maybe I don't know two months of the season before the market caught on a little bit. Um, so again, like I, I think the point to be made here is regardless of what happened last year, Autry has has pretty much told us at this point he wants to play fast. He wants to just he wants to be an athletic team that gets up and down the floor. Like that's his thing. And he'll go back into zone if he has to. I think about 20% of the time last year, Syracuse went back to the zone, maybe a little bit out of necessity, but you're telling me that you love the athletes on this team. Maybe we see less zone. Maybe he uses it as less of a crutch this year and goes just full-blown man-to-man, which should lend itself to to some, some scoring. Now, the other thing I want to point out here that I think a lot of people don't understand if they're not like Syracuse area people that go to games at the Dome is – the way Syracuse schedules and the opportunity there is to take points against Syracuse early in the season. It happens every year. So you look at Sy- Syracuse schedules the same way every year. Bayheim scheduled this way forever. He's going to play a bunch of, of, of local teams at the Dome that he's going to be a huge favorite in. And then he's going to play a few neutral site games that are typically in New York, either at Barclay Center or at the Garden, right? Or an MTE, like last year they went out to, to Hawaii, whatever. And then usually he's contracted into like one like road game. Like this year, it's going to be at Tennessee as part of the uh, SEC ACC challenge. So not much choice in the matter there. I think we had LSU at home last year. This year, they're hitting the road to play Tennessee. So you're talking about Buff. You've got Lemoyne, Colgate, Youngstown State, Cornell, Albany, Bucknell, all basically like local team, you know, a couple hours from, from the Syracuse area for all of them. Syracuse will be big favorites in all of those at home. Going back the last couple of years, I can think of of like five off the top of my head, last two seasons. Canisius covered at the Dome. Niagara covered at the Dome. Colgate nearly, I think Colgate beat a, a one at the Dome a couple of times. And then I think they were up 25 last year before Syracuse came roaring back to win. I do believe Colgate still covered. I know Cornell has had success at the Dome. So for me, Buff, I, I will look early in the early going to take some of those big numbers when Syracuse is at home, because I'm going back to like, you know, what, what we were talking about with the organization and the lack of defense. I think it's going to be hard for Syracuse to just, you know, throttle some of these teams by like 15, 20 points. And I think that's probably what the line is going to be in some of these games. That's exactly what I'm going to probably do too, Adam. I'm going to try to target some spots in the beginning of the season where these teams that are playing like, quote unquote, their Super Bowl, when they come to town and play Syracuse, this is like the biggest game of the year for them. The Colgates, yep. the Cornells, the LeMoynes, the Albany. University of Buff. Yeah, the Albanese, the Buffaloes, you know, all the teams that are in close vicinity here, that's their big shot. We're going to come to the Dome. We get to play in a, you know, fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000 stadium or, you know, attendance stadium. This is going to be our you know, do or die game of the year right here. Let's go and upset Syracuse. And because now, now Bob, Oh, you keep going. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, because we have so many new additions in the starting mm-hmm. lineup and the new incoming freshmen that are going to come in November, they're not going to be even close to clicking really well. I think like right. you mentioned, maybe we start to try to look at targeting some of these underdogs that are getting double digits when they come to the dome. Maybe they lose by seven, maybe they lose by eight, but 13 and 14 and 15, those that might be too many points for Syracuse in the beginning of the year. Now we can adjust as the season goes on. And when they start getting used to playing with each other and then it becomes ACC time, maybe they'll be flourishing then to where we become the team where, we might be able to take Syracuse plus the points and be able to cash that way. Well, I, I, Buff, I'll even go sooner than that because they're going to go down to Barclays Center three, uh, two different times for three games in, in the in the non-conference. They're going to play the Legends Classic against Texas, and then they're going to play, I think, either St. Joe's or Texas Tech, and then they've got a standalone game down there against Maryland. And that's the other thing that should get highlighted here. Barclay Center is like Q's 2.0 home home game, right? Like there's a huge contingent of Syracuse alum down near the city. A lot of these Syracuse fans will travel and make that trip. 
So they've been, Bayheim's been doing this for years, and I like to see that Autry's continuing to go down to New York City and play games because it's going to be all orange in Barclays Center and not Texas orange. It's going to be all Absolutely. Syracuse orange down there for, for that game. And so, you, yeah, like you were saying, now all of a sudden, maybe they underachieve in some of these spots as like a huge favorite, but you're probably getting them catching a couple points on a neutral. That's going to be a great spot to back Syracuse, in my opinion. Absolutely. And especially like where, the, where those games fall in the season, we're going to have a little more experience by then. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. the, fr- the freshman with Donnie Freeman and, and Lampkins and, you know, the Hofstra kid and the guy from Delaware. I mean, we're going to have all these transfers that are coming over. And, you know, I would imagine that the team is going to be gelling and playing a lot better as they get more experience of playing with each other. It's going to take some time. These guys are all coming from different, you know, different ways of life, different basketball teams, different styles. And it's going to take some time for them to get out there and play together as one unit. Really, really good. So, yes, I, I and like you mentioned, too, another thing with the Dome is in the beginning of the season, Syracuse fans, they they say, oh, you know, this is just a cupcake game. You know, I'm not going to waste yep. my time and, you know, walk way up the hill and go to this game. And, you know, so. You might get, like you mentioned, you might get 20,000, but it's a really quiet 20,000. You know, the fans aren't yeah. going crazy like like Duke in North Carolina or in town. So, you know, the vibes are are not the same. And it kind of, mm-hmm. it, it sets up, it sets up for the, the visiting team, the, you know, the Colgates and the Holy Crosses and the Lemoines to come in here and compete hard for 40 minutes and walk out with, you know, maybe only losing by single digits and, to them, that's, you know, that's a win. Yeah, huge, huge downgrade. Like, if you are if you price home court advantage into your handicap, which you should, huge downgrade to Syracuse early in the season when the Dome is not full. Because what a lot of people don't understand is 15,000 in the Dome is, like, quiet. It doesn't feel like anyone's there. It, it, it's just this huge cavernous venue for basketball. Doesn't feel like anyone's there. Now, later in the season, when you get into ACC play, and suddenly it's 25, 30,000 in the dome. That's a whole different story. But again, if you're pricing Syracuse home field or home, your home court, as you should be early in the year, when they're playing those teams, you know, I'm just going to read off the schedule when they're playing the Lemoyne, Colgate, Youngstown, Cornell, Albany, Bucknell at the dome, there is virtually no home court advantage, almost a negative home court advantage, in my opinion, like should, should be applied. And the final thing I'll say, Buff, as we wrap this up, uh, because we went long on this one, so I'm going to wrap this up here, is going to ACC play, I'm going to be looking for defensive improvement. I think if this team is playing better defensively in in January than they are in November, they could be a very dangerous team come conference play and a team I'll probably be looking to back, you know, in some of the bigger games in conference play. Yeah, if I see some cohesion and I see some improvement and I see that, they're starting to gel and play well together in the early parts of the season when we play some of these cupcakes, then they're definitely going to be a play on team for me as an underdog yep. when, when the ACC season begins. Yeah. And just where they're priced in the market. Like I said, a lot, I think they're, they're being kind of considered like a middle of the pack team in the ACC. So yeah. if they do just demonstrate, if they can like realize some of their upside without a doubt, they should be a fantastic team against the number all right Dave, Buff, i really appreciate you coming on talking uh you know talking syracuse hoops with me uh guys just tell them where they can find you on twitter and then we'll uh we'll wrap this up yeah you can um follow me on twitter my uh, my twitter handle is jeff buff 73 um i post a lot of free stuff on there all the time football and basketball big sports fan um and uh yeah give me a follow and follow my page and We'll catch some uh, tickets together during college basketball season. Thanks for having me on. Head on over. Absolutely. Uh, I appreciate it. And again, uh, if you're if you're seeing this preview and you like this preview and you want to see other previews, head on over to the Wager Talk YouTube channel. We're going to have 30 of these by tip off on November 4th. Uh, our, our video team at Wager Talk has made it made them all into one playlist. So super convenient and easy to find them all this year. Um, you can find all of my stuff over at Wager Talk and on all social media platforms at Adam Trigger, Adam Trigger WT. And I also have a great special right now. It's only going to be up, you know, 
only going to be up prior to the season. Coupon code TRIGCBB, T-R-I-G, CBB, gets you the entire season at like a ridiculously low rate, the lowest rate we've ever done for a full season, um, and, and that's active now. So take advantage of that. That's over on my page at wagertalkwt.buzz slash AT. Thank you to my guest, Jeff Buff, Buffum, one more time, and um, we'll see you for more previews later this week.